Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our participants and also our panelists. This is the third in our series of global salons on critical topics that we've done this year. In the last month, we have had two really fantastic cross-disciplinary, cross-regional um, perspectives on first future cities and then democratic challenges and change. We're really excited um, this morning or this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're located. We're really excited for this conversation today on a, an in incredibly important topic, I think, to all of us, which is inequality and social justice. This is a topic that has to be addressed from multiple locations, whether from the global perspective to a regional one, and also from specific locations with all of our place-based histories and contexts. So we're really happy to have panelists here today from our Global Hub partners. The Global Hubs are Cornell University's strategic partners across the world, partners with whom we're building educational research and engagement um, exchanges in order to address some of these challenging and also some of the exciting questions in front of us. So thank you to everyone for joining and participating, and thank you to Rachel Riedel and the iNaudi team for organizing and hosting these salons. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you to everyone for being here and joining us for this exciting and important conversation. And thanks to all of our audience members for, for logging in. I want to also invite our audience members to really share in this conversation um, by entering your questions, your ideas, your reactions, and even links to your own research centers and projects that are related into the Q&A function so that we can use your inputs there as a way to continue follow on conversations. Um, and that way we can also bring those questions to the panelists um, after our, introductory, our introductions round to be able to um, engage the audience as well. We'll use all of these discussions, the questions that you pose, the conversation itself as a springboard for our next steps of potential collaborations as we launch this thematic topic today with all of our collaborators from across the globe. I want to be brief so we can move to our experts, but I do just want to briefly explain the charge we've given each of our panelists, what you'll hear from them today, and that is to do three things. First, to introduce themselves. Secondly, to introduce the types of initiatives they're working on that might move across their centers and universities, how they are already engaged in collaborative and interdisciplinary teams. And then third, to tell us how they see this topic moving forward. What is the future frontier of inequalities and social justice? What are the types of questions, types of work that we need to be taking up together across regions, across the globe to be able to advance this topic um, productively and in response to the questions of our time? So really a kind of next generation thinking. We're looking forward to your responses. Thank you to each of our panelists for being here. And we'll start with our first expert, Kashik Basu from Cornell University. Thank you, Kashik. Oh, Kashik, I think you're muted. Yes, that always happens. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rachel, Wendy, all of you for being here for this very, very important discussion. Let me just tell you, I am professor of economics at Cornell University. And since you want to know my current uh, concern, I'm actually working currently on group moral responsibility. And that brings in multiple disciplines, which I've always enjoyed in interacting with, in this case, politics, sociology, philosophy, and of course, economics. That's my current work. But engagement on this topic, the topic that we are discussing, it's not something that I'm currently working on, but let me just tell you that I personally believe <clears throat> that the level of inequality in the world is intolerable. We, all of us, those who are listening, me, we are on the better end of this. If you look at the global spectrum, we are on the better end, but that is no reason for us to be silent. We are just lucky in this extremely unequal world to be at the better end, but it is a matter of global concern. If you think of the richest and the poorest, the distinction I remember, computing a little back of the envelope calculation that all the people in three countries, A, B, C to remember easily, 
Angola, Burkina Faso, and Congo Democratic Republic, their total wealth is a little less than the total wealth of the three richest people in the world. Three individuals, three countries. And I do believe that there will come a time when human beings looking back at us will be shocked that we tolerated this kind of inequality living in there. But I don't blame individuals. We are all a part of the system, but this is something that we need to be engaged with. Institutional engagement, since Rachel mentioned that we should talk about, I did have in the World Bank in a big way on this topic. And I'll tell you something specific that I worked with a whole team and it was introduced. Now it seems very easy, but it, there was a lot of pushback when we were introducing. Among World Bank's mission goals, there are two, three things that the World Bank is organized around. I was asked by the president when I joined to think of additional new mission goals and I put in one which is called shared prosperity. And the idea was the following. We human beings love to compare different countries on different criteria. We do by GDP, GDP per capita. I said shared prosperity should be looking at the bottom 40% of every country and then comparing countries by how the bottom 40% fares. And that became the shared prosperity goal. And the World Bank since then collects and makes available data on the bottom 40% of every country, how they are faring. So that was my direct engagement as just an academic's little contribution to being sensitive to the bottom end of society. Let me jump straight away and two minutes on future where the research agenda is going. I believe this is something that we will all have to take on, that as technology progresses, mechanical labor is, the need for mechanical labor is going to go down the world over. This is not happening immediately. It's happening immediately in rich countries, in United States, in upper middle income countries, the need for mechanical labor is going down, but poorer countries where there is much cheaper labor available, there's space for this, but this is going to go. How do we take on the challenge when the demand for labor goes down? What do we do is I feel urgent and we ought to talk about this. One thing that people say is that if you give people an income, without them having to work for it, you hurt their dignity and pride. I believe in some circumstances that is true, but if you have a right to a certain amount of income, it is not hurting your pride. And the bigger example I give is in the olden days, feudal lords, the leisure class that did very little work and other people worked, we did not worry about the leisure classes, emotions being wounded. They're feeling so hurt that they are getting a lot of money without having to work at all. I feel the way the world is going, a lot of the income is going to be from ownership of the robots, of the machines, etc., And that has to be shared. So what we need to think about is many of the standard legislative methods like antitrust law. Yes, we should use them, but I don't think that will be enough. We need to think of a certain form of shared prosperity in the following sense, profit sharing of certain kinds. And I'm not saying take away the profit and everything should be state owned. I think that's a big mistake that gets captured and then it becomes an oligarchy. Russia, USSR began with this, everything got state owned. And then a few people captured that and it became an, in fact an ultra right wing oligarchy. What I'm suggesting is something very different, that for a fraction of the profit, people have ownership individually. And you, as the society earns more, you begin to get that. But there are cross-country problems. Even if you begin to do this within the country, how do you work that across countries? So there'll be big challenges, but this is a big enough problem. And I like to believe that sometime in the future, the inequality will vastly go down. And we will look back in today, at today's world, the way we look back at some of the past injustices. And we are shocked that human beings tolerated that, that future generations will be shocked that we tolerated this. But this is both a challenge of emotions. We do want to correct this, but it is an intellectual challenge. Just being angry, you cannot correct it. You will in fact walk into the hands of crony capitalists if you just allow your anger to try to correct this. It is an intellectual problem as well. And I'm glad that as a university and all of you from different parts are together to take on a problem of this kind. Let me stop with that and I may come back during Q&A. Kashik, thank you so much for starting us with that charge. It's indeed perfect to 
to really highlight the intolerable nature of our current world of inequality. Next, we'll move to Masusu Chirwa from the University of Zambia. Thank you so much. I think you also need to unmute, please. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll talk about um, inequalities and social, social injustice in Zambia. Then from there, I'll link it to um, uh, the studies that I'm, I'm currently doing, though they may not directly link to uh, inequalities and social, social injustice, but to some extent, I'll be able to, to show you how, how the two uh, the two link um, connect. So in terms of um, social injustice, um, social injustice lies at the heart of deprivation uh, faced by, by the poor majority Zambians, you know, and this tends to hinder them from enjoying quality of life. Um, Zambia has gone through economic transformation from a socialist, what we call uh, uh, humanism to capitalism. So this economic liberalization in Zambia, while it was heralded uh, as an economic success story, uh, it has failed to translate to poverty reduction. Okay? Instead, uh, the introduction of a free market economy has led to an even uh, economic growth, which has resulted in increasingly an even distribution of wealth between the twin you know, wealthy households and, and, and the poor ones. Uh, so disparities based on um, household uh, wealth in Zambia and on areas of residence, they play a major role in driving, you know, social injustice. So I'll give you an example. We have a new government and according to the new government, um, basic education is free in Zambia. So many children from poor households, but they're still out of school due to various structural you know, challenges that they face. So what we also see in Zambia is that poor households also face numerous challenges in accessing um, uh, quality health services. And that's where now I'll link um, uh, the studies that I'm currently undertaking, issues of access to, to health services. So in Zambia, you know, various inequalities in accessing health um, uh, services and health outcomes are driven by persistent poverty. So poverty is quite high. So that has an impact on how people access health services. Um, so high inequality in its various forms is a form of injustice and a driver to intergenerational poverty. You know, so inequality in Zambia is strongly rooted in the rural urban divide. So we have a phenomenon which we call the Rhino Leo. So the, the, the towns that, or the cities that are located along the line of rail, which run from the southern part of Zambia to a region we call Copper Belt, these are modern and poverty there is not as much as the cities that lie outside this line. Um, so therefore, you know, the further site is a town is from the rail line, the poorer it is. So rural households tend to be worse in terms of uh, you know, social, economic, and demographic features compared to those that are uh, along the, the, the line of rail. Um, so Zambia basically faces, Zambian, Zambian households basically face a number of numerous structural injustices. Um, I've talked about injustices within the health sector. And now I'm going to link this to uh, the studies that I'm currently working on. I'm currently working on a number of studies, but among these uh, is the study that is um, focusing on understanding uh, the social cultural dynamics of transmission of, of, um, of so understanding the social cultural dynamics of transmission and mental health effects of COVID-19 in Zambia. Okay. Then uh, I'm also carrying out a study that is focusing on um, gender analysis. And this study aims at generating a board of evidence 
to inform program implementation and uh, system strengthening uh, within the area of sexual reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, health and nutritional service delivery in Zambia. Uh, so focusing on uh, the study that uh, is looking at the social cultural dynamics of transmission and mental health effects of uh, COVID-19 in Zambia. You know, uh, this study has, um, has, has two themes. So the first one seeks to investigate how social behaviors and population movement patterns in Zambia influence uh, the risks of COVID-19 transmission within and between quarantine zones, that is rural and urban, urban zones. So the second theme of this study focuses on it, it um, investigates the impact of COVID-19 on individual and community mental health, including fear, you know, stigma, and other forms of discrimination. So there's attachment of you know, stigma and, and discrimination, especially to those who are the survivors of, of COVID-19. So I'm trying to understand you know, evidence-based solutions to build a greater community trust and prevent social conflicts, especially involving survivors of COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Chirawa. That's perfect. Um, I think you'll, you'll hear many um, overlaps also with some of our um, related experts on health policy. Next, we'll move to Dr. Antonio Carcelen Estrada from the Universidad San Francisco de Quito. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Antonia. I am assistant professor at the College of Social Sciences and Humanities in um, USFQ in Ecuador. Um, I work all kinds of interdisciplinary research, but mostly with translation studies, uh, global South decolonial thinking, cultural studies, race, orature, historiography. Um, currently, the initiatives that I am involved with, I mean, I'm, there's various, no? There's activism and translation. That is something that I've always done now. And that is a, a very important part of research in terms of understanding migration routes and uh, refugee crisis and, um, you know, inequality in that sense and access to language so that you can have access to the law. I also work with uh, orality and issues of memory. So there's a lot of the trauma, collective trauma that gets um, processed through orality in these migration uh, processes that are global. I also work um, with uh, British scholars on a grant for development. And that is a very interesting project. It connects critical geography and it uh, development studies to try to um, establish networks for uh, as an alternative development to uh, extractivism because there's a context of extreme violence because the extractivist economy that we are forced to live under is very violent on the people that they dispossess in the process. And that is also a lot of inequalities in terms of um, climate, this, you know, crisis in the future, but um, inequality in terms of environmental justice, which is another part of social justice. Um, so it's not just political and civil rights, it's also environmental justice rights. There's also um, work I do with the Amazon and that's very interesting work because it doesn't have any grants and it's not vouched by any fancy organizations, but it's all transnational activism and communication, uh, communitarian media projects that are connecting indigenous people across the Amazon to do media content in their own uh, indigenous languages to promote the revitalization of indigenous languages in the Amazon. And it started with the Quijos, which is an interesting case study of an indigenous um, group in the Amazon that wants to recover at that language. But there are others who um, work through the networks of Lanceros Digitales, um, very interesting projects. And uh, finally, we just started an institute for the advanced uh, study of inequality at USFQ, which you're all more than welcome to collaborate with. 
And in those, in that institute, we're working with um, Canadians a lot and with Tanzania um, to do a data gap analysis for gender violence and the different ways that colonialism plays out in its specificity in each context. And that is going to also be connected with Central America, with Honduras. So that's another interdisciplinary project. And that's it. And I am also a member of the uh, translation, uh, advanced study of, on translation center in Italy, in Rimini. And that is another place where uh, inequality is, uh, you know, it's run to it because the idea of translation in a way, it's also not just like posing meaning from one side to another, but in a way allowing the possibility to, to be heard and to question certain things. But um, in the process of all of my projects, what I mostly try to do is how do you make the meaning of others make sense? Um, and that's pretty much what I, you know, what I try to focus on, like how to break this impossibility of injustice systems to like have something out of it that can in some way benefit the local community that is usually facing violence, threat, dispossession, sexual violence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the work I do. Um, about the future, that is a very good question. I only just can say that I hope the next generation, I am very hopeful on the next generation. I always am. They are um, always my inspiration, my students, because they can see things. They have the language to talk about inequality. They have the language to talk about race that many times many professors don't have and cannot have. And so that is very um, inspiring and also the digital literacy and how they can handle that. And so I, I see that that's another place where we can address um, issues with through the students on inequality, like making their curriculum be tied to projects and not a learning classroom experience that is more close to the 18th century than the 21st. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Carcelen Estrada. Um, really fascinating points in terms of really thinking about the intersection with a lot of work um, that's going on at Cornell, both on the Migrations in Initiative and thinking about climate justice. Our next panelist is Chong Yun Choi from the National University of Singapore. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I have uh, slides to share, so let me first start by uh, sharing that. So um, I am a lecturer uh, in the Department of Political Science at the National University of Singapore. Um, my personal research interests revolve around these questions. Uh, why does democracy not always reduce inequality? Uh, under what conditions does democracy reduce inequality? And in answering these questions, um, I mostly focus on the market income distribution phase um, because I feel uh, much more attention has been paid to the redistributive phase and uh, less attention has been paid to how democracy can affect the uh, distributive phase. So in one of my research focusing on labor's share of national income, I find that uh, trade openness uh, diminishes or moderates the effect of democracy on labor share so that uh, at low levels of trade openness, uh, democracy has a positive effect on labor share, but that its effect uh, diminishes as trade openness increases. And I'm exploring other uh, conditions uh, that can affect how democracy uh, shapes inequality. Um, to talk about some research, uh, collaborative uh, research efforts at NUS, uh, one uh, institute at NUS that um, does a lot of research in this area is the Institute of Policy Studies, uh, housed at the Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy. And uh, this institute adopts, explicitly adopts a multidisciplinary approach in its analysis. So the central questions it asks are, uh, what are the drivers of inequality and social mobility in Singapore? Uh, what policies are needed to level the playing field? Um, ongoing projects are many, but just to list some, uh, they would be uh, things like digital inclusion, uh, single Indian, Indian mothers and targeted intervention, skills gap, et cetera. 
Um, another institute at NUS uh, is SSR, or the Social Service Research Center, which is housed at, in the uh, fac oops, excuse me, uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And its mission is to bring together resources and ideas to test social innovation. So these are uh, some of the projects that are ongoing at the SSR. Now, in terms of future research agenda, um, so some th things are related to, uh, I guess, my own personal interest. I, I think more could be explored in terms of the macro level factors that affect how democracy influences inequality. So things like links with the global economy, uh, domestic political economic institutions, uh, social conditions, uh, et cetera. And uh, also another uh, research agenda, I think that that's, uh, potentially fruitful is uh, when people actually react to inequality. Uh, research in psychology finds that uh, people actually care more about uh, uh, fairness uh, or unfairness uh, than, than inequality. So uh, I'm interested and I think it's, um, it'll be fruitful to ask what factors shape how or when people perceive inequality as just or unjust. So um, I think some factors that can affect that would be things like social mobility, meritocracy, corruption, etc. cetera. And that, that's it, that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. That's fascinating and really gives us a lot of um, opportunity to think about these intersections with the work you're doing. Next, we'll move to Dr. Jamila Michner at Cornell University. Hello, everyone, um, and good day, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening where you are. I have really very much enjoyed hearing everyone's presentations so far. Um, I'll tell you a bit about my work and then talk a bit about what I see as important in the future, and the two are linked, so hopefully they'll make sense together. I'm an associate professor of government and public policy at Cornell, so I'm a political scientist by training who focuses on public policy at the intersection of uh, racism, poverty, and inequality. Much of my work focuses on health and healthcare in the US context. Um, and a growing body of my work is focused on housing and housing inequality in the US context. Uh, I do a lot of things at Cornell that link to institutions here at Cornell that might be um, interesting to or relevant to some of you all. I've heard quite a few people talking about health and I'm co-director of Cornell Center for Health Equity. I uh, co-direct also an initiative called the Politics of Race, Immigration, Class and Ethnicity Initiative here in the government department at Cornell. Um, and I've also been a part of, and I'm excited about, uh, been a part of thinking about and brainstorming and continue to be a part of um, building an infrastructure for a center that is developing here at Cornell called the Center for Racial Justice and Equitable Futures. Um, which, among other things, in initial conversations when we brainstormed uh, what a center like this should look like, we really focused on a center that had a global reach and emphasis, even as it was able to attend to um, and grapple with the particularities of specific contexts like the U.S. and beyond. And so hearing all of you speak really kind of reinforces and reinvigorates my interest in developing that kind of institution that I think can bring in a lot of the concerns that we've been talking about, even if our specific contextual emphases vary. Uh, so I will say my work around um, race, poverty and public policy, the kind of core of that work has been focused on health policy. And as a political scientist, I think not just about how health policies like a policy Medicaid, a policy that we have here in the US that serves mostly low income populations and disproportionately um, Black and Latino uh, populations of color. Uh, so not only how a program or, or a policy like that affects health outcomes, whether people live or die, how long they live or die, how, how well they live or die in terms of their health, which is important. Uh, but as a political scientist, I think about how programs like that affect people's power and voice, uh, their positioning in social and political communities and as a result of that positioning, their ability to influence policies going forward, right? And so thinking about health policy as a political scientist points me to critical questions about power. And if there's a word or an idea that 
I think is really critical to sort of introduce and center in this conversation. Power is probably the word, and I think it lies at the center of a lot of what I've heard people share thus far, but is one that often we don't quite put our finger on. Uh, when I think about the future, uh, it's, it's, it feels brighter after spending the last few minutes with you all, to be honest. Uh, the world is a hard place right now, so I appreciate the light that you all are shining um, in it. When I think about the possibilities, if we have an approach that, uh, an approach to difficult questions about inequality and justice that is interdisciplinary, um, that is collaborative, and that involves working with one another in ways that cross our boundaries and comfort zones. So I will say in some of the work that I've been doing focused on housing and building power for housing justice in the US context, it's really been interesting and heartening to see organizers in the US um, uh, working with people across the world, right? Uh, and so when I think about the future, I think that those collaborative relationships and not just collaborating around good policy, but collaborating around redistributing not only resources, but power and studying how to have that happen and how those processes uh, operate across the world that's something that I would be excited about uh, in terms of future directions. And I'll stop there. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Jamila. I'm really seeing so much resonance there in terms of really thinking about even Antonia's um, for earlier comments about climate justice and um, addressing dispossession in different ways, um, as well as the health policy overlaps. And thank you for, for sharing your light with us all. Um, next, we'll move to Dr. Ina. Macniborada from Tecnologico de Monterrey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to have um, our research agenda presented here in this forum. Yeah, I'm professor in Tecnologico de Monterrey. Originally, I am a lawyer, yeah, and I used to be a corporate lawyer, and my academic research uh, was around corporate responsibility, international procedural law, dispute resolution, alternative methods. So um, until uh, uh, the last year, actually, uh, the social pro uh, projects as such, they weren't on my uh, research agenda until... Uh, the problems yeah, got revealed in my own uh, law firm when we actually faced the problem of gender inequality in the society and uh, we found out that it affects the growth of uh, people who work with us, yeah, the opportunities for women. Mm, there were plenty of uh, personal situations yeah, around female employees that actually revealed uh, the social problem existing in the society. But for already several years, Tech de Monterey in general and uh, professors and students uh, who work and study in this university, uh, we work in social initiatives, yeah, and we work it in the framework of so-called social uh, mortgage. In Spanish, it is called hipoteca social, yeah. It is, uh, this is an initiative of Tech de Monterrey to involve our students in social um, project to promote personal responsibility and accountability in front of the society, yeah, uh, because uh, we revealed uh, that in the Mexican society, most of the uh, careers and uh, professions, they do not require uh, social work of, of whatever kind. Yeah, So this is why the institution assumed responsibilities in front of the society, obliging the students to get involved in social projects during the time of their studies. And we have uh, volunteer projects for uh, professors as well. Yeah? So nowadays, it, it is impossible to be part of our institutions for students yeah, without participation in this kind of social projects. In the area of law, I can give you examples, for example, what, what our students uh, in particular can do. Uh, they go to rural areas and they help um, uh, people living there, indigenous people, uh, to register their IP rights of um, uh, their traditional uh, works, or they help uh, people with uh, the lack of resources to register their businesses, yeah, small businesses, and to support local societies. Yeah. And uh, the main obstacles that we received during this uh, initiative of Tech de Monterrey, it's a very specific political environment. Uh, 
that now I'm not going to discuss here, yeah, but uh, I will focus more on the absence or the limited number of socially responsible businesses yeah, still in this society. And in relation to legal profession, yeah, what also uh, we revealed uh, those problems for research agenda, uh, these are the following ones. Yeah? Firstly, the absence of uh, social work requirement for getting the license to practice law. Yeah? The absence of requirement to update skills and knowledge, uh, yeah, something uh, which is more than normal in uh, other countries, yeah, still it's not part of legal profession and work. Uh, there is no requirement for pro bono work. Um, lawyers very often, uh, they require social agenda or pro bono agenda, but when you ask what is the project, yeah, um, most of them, they will not be able even to state the project. The national bar is not a self-regulated institution here yeah that imposes personal responsibility on lawyers uh, this is why it's responsibility of institutions to promote this feeling of uh, uh, being socially responsible having values principles here yeah? and uh, this situation provokes inequality in all possible dimensions yeah and um, uh, the biggest problem is focused on inequality of genders um, this is why these initiatives of social mortgage promoted by Tech de Monterey and uh, personal example of academic leaders is extremely important for uh, making our students uh, grow professionally, yeah? in particular in the ambit of uh, legal profession. Uh, so in my in my uh, law firm, we started the project that nowadays will be my research agenda as well. Uh, this is a project of gender equality. I was asked why gender equality first, yeah? Uh, firstly, because um, in uh, Mexico, we do not see female partners in most of the law firms, yeah? When we started social project in our law firm and uh, we needed uh, to have a help, from marketing agency to promote the projects among um, female specialists who do not uh, have access uh, to the opportunities which we offered, uh, we started checking the number of female uh, partners in the law firms. And you will be surprised that uh, most of the law firms in Mexico, they don't have any, any female partners. Yeah, the biggest law firm with 30 partners has zero female partners. Yeah? So this is why uh, we uh, started the project a social initiative uh, which will provoke your investigation in this area. The project is called Sigi Derecho. In, in English, it can be presented as, as Ghost Right Ahead or Follow the Law. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the project is devoted to the promotion of uh, profiles of female uh, lawyers from other parts of Republic. For other, it means outside of Mexico City. Yeah? Uh, to have them invited uh, for practice in our law firm and to cover all their needs for living, uh, arranging uh, space where to live, yeah, arranging the space uh, close to office because uh, Mexico City is quite a dangerous part of uh, the world in general, yeah, in Mexico. So such initiative uh, will um, give us the um, opportunity firstly to interview uh, yeah, the candidates and uh, then those who will be part of uh, the project already of scholarship as we call it and it will give us the basis for further uh, research yeah and uh, the gender equality it's a stone on which we can build a church of diversity in general because the mexican society is uh, very diversified and uh, you will be surprised that we have for example mexican african settlements in some part of mexico but you will not see uh, these representatives in uh, legal profession in mexico city so such situations uh, they cannot be tolerated uh, yeah and we will move uh, forward uh, with such projects you're promoting them among students and among academic professionals as well so this is the information which we present for example as a reason for the project uh, that uh, in Mexico out of 100 percent uh, places in uh, a legal profession only 38 are occupied by women and as I told you you will you almost will not see women on influential positions in uh, law yeah so as well you will see that already we have more than 50 percent female students in law faculties but we don't see this representation in influential positions in Mexico 
And uh, as well, we have very interesting initiatives uh, coming from uh, uh, yeah, high, uh, um, high level law firms yeah, uh, to organize departments where, um, um, where women would be able to uh, take influential positions. But unfortunately, this is an idea to segregate women, not to create some common projects with them. So this is a research agenda, which currently we have. Yeah? Thank Many you things. So much. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Magniborada. Really appreciate it. And we have other uh, legal scholars who are, are here, um, will be presenting soon as well to speak to that. Next, we have Dr. Mamya Mensabus Bonsu from the University of Ghana. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Miss Mensa Bonsu. I'm aspiring to the title you just gave me. So just to correct that. Um, I'm, I'm a really early career academic, so I'm excited to um, to see what other people are doing and to learn. Um, so about my work, I, I focus uh, mostly on disability and uh, gender rights and law. And in particular, I am interested in exploring the intersections of these broad areas, because I found that at least um, in my part of the world, there's a lot of research in these uh, specific areas individually, but very few of them have explored the overlaps and the issues that arise when you have uh, gender intersecting with disability and with human rights law. Um, and so I look at um, these areas and in particular the effect of law on socioeconomic development of women generally, uh, but more specifically on persons with disabilities and their female caregivers. And this research area is, is as much a, a career path as it is a personal uh, space for me because I'm, I'm a mother of a child with disabilities. So that's how this uh, developed into what are my rights? Uh, what, 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 where do I go? Um, and then I realized that there was nowhere to go and that there were really nuanced um, understandings that were missing from the law and uh, which perhaps only uh, through a lived experience could someone speak to the issues arising there. So that's, that's, that's for me, my key questions are how does the law or how does the operation of law create gaps in the law? And by gaps, I mean unregulated spaces for women and specifically for mothers with, disability, with children with disabilities. And I, I found that the laws in Ghana tended to look at the end, what I call the end product, when the, the person with disability or the child with disability has already grown up and is potentially sufficient or still dependent, but not so much the framework surrounding that person with disability and how to make sure that um, we have children who actually grow up to that, that level. We don't, we, we, we are, we've cut out those people at the back. Um, and so it's, if you survive and you make it to, to the end <laughs> as an adult, then you can assert some rights. But we still have challenges with infanticide, particularly of children with disabilities um, and so much deprivation of children with disabilities that you can imagine that is have a high mortality rate still. So my interest is in closing those gaps. And my hypothesis really is that it's, it's in dealing with the gaps left by the unregulated women that we can um, protect properly the rights of children with disabilities. And how do we use the law or the regulatory frameworks um, to achieve this goal? Um, the future of this, of my general research agenda, I think that my research interests are already so intersectional um, that is ripe for interdisciplinary and multilateral research uh, because it's so span, you know, medical legal practices, psychology, uh, human rights law, disability tax law even. Um, and so it's by the very nature, they are open to interdisciplinary multi multilateral research. So currently what I'm working on is on COVID-19 uh, fiscal policy. So in the wake of COVID-19, there's been so many areas and where there are gaps for persons with disabilities. So we are starting one on fiscal policies, examining um, the fiscal policies and legislation that sprang out of COVID-19 and whether those are inclusive to cover 
uh, persons with disabilities and their, their caregivers. Um, so that's what we are working on right now. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Wonderful. Really appreciated that, Dr. Man uh, no, Ms. Uh, uh, Mensa Bonsu. Next, we'll go to Dr. Siba Gravogi from Cornell University. Siba, can you unmute? My name is Siba Grovogi. Sorry about that. My name is Siba Grovogi, and I'm here at Cornell University of Africana Studies uh, Center. Um, I am a lawyer, like many people have said here, and I look, work on humanitarian law more broadly. Um, and obviously, within that, my central concern has always been global justice and, and et cetera. But for the lawyers around, I want to say that jurisprudence and doctrine is not necessarily my focus, my focus is on political and moral thought. And uh, right now, I'm actually working uh, on a project uh, which uh, is at the cross section of legal ontology, political aesthetic, and historical sensibility. And basically, I have one central question, which is um, how do we imagine a future? in which policy still relies <clears throat> on a set of settlement and practices uh, centered around certain vision of passion, interest, value, and norms since the 19th, uh, that exist since the 17th century that have yet to figure out how we get out of our own predicament, including, including the increasing social inequalities and et cetera. And my answer actually is um, uh, to answer some of the questions is that uh, that uh, um, is not, and actually speaking directly to Professor Basu's initial comment, uh, utopia may not be what we need, but quantum leap is possible. And I think that what uh, my project is doing right now is to work at the intersection of uh, 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 sensibility, language, and historical thought. And I'm interested in, in how two ideas worked in the Africana diaspora from the 17th century to the present. And you can see that 17th century is important for me in both sen senses, because I want to do a historical sweep to see how language and sensibility and thought have worked themselves into constitutional project from Quilombolas in Brazil, all the way to South Africa with Nelson Mandela via decolonization, civil rights movement in America, et cetera, et cetera. All of them centered around two key principles. One, that there should be no public, public no partial public sympathies no partial public sympathies, and the other one, obligation, that one should not desire something that they may not imagine other people to have. And I think that, that if I, if I and, and I, this is obviously a very large historical project, but I think that, that I, because I don't have enough time here, but I think that if um, my, my sense of the orientation of legal thought around social justice is actually to try to get ourselves outside of the street jacket of thought in which we are and historical sensibilities to create new ones for us. And, and, and I want to extract that from the idea of utopia, which is always where people go because utopia is impossible, but I wanted to place this in actual practices that are within a certain diaspora, which actually is not just possible, so it's not a flight of fancy, but the plausible. So the plausible and the possible are contrasted and, and I actually want to see the new horizons in which we can place our, our thinking process to go to work toward uh, uh, social justice, and I stop there. Thank you so much, Siba. I think that's really well put and what is possible and plausible and, and what her, new horizons we can imagine. That's what we're doing here together. Next, we'll go to Dr. Soraj um, Hongladoram from Chuala Longkorn yes. University. Uh, thanks a lot, Rachel. And I'm very glad to be here uh, with us uh, talking about e inequality. Uh, I'll be brief and I try to finish everything <laughs> within the time uh, slot that we have. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our center, the Center for Science, Technology and Society here at Chulalongkorn University. By the way, it's 9 p.m. here, so it's a uh, good evening to all of you from Thailand. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary center 
uh, we have four members. Uh, our purpose, our objective is to be a focal point for interdisciplinary kind of effort within the university, especially concerning STS, science, technology, and society. Uh, I'm from philosophy originally, and uh, I'm trying to uh, coordinate with colleagues who are who have interests in in this kind of collaborative uh, and interdisciplinary work to to get together uh, my own work is focused on applied ethics and philosophy of technology my latest book is on the ethics of ai uh, a buddhist perspective so I'm, I'm talking about how AI could contribute to social good and how AI could uh, be a force for, for creating a more equitable and, and uh, a just society, uh, how, how it could create uh, a form of social justice. And that is not automatic, of course, and we need to think clearly and systematically. And I think that's where uh, philosophy can make its own contribution as to how such a powerful technology as AI could, could uh, accomplish such a task. Uh, and uh, the, the other three members, I would like to introduce their words. Perhaps uh, they can uh, collaborate and, and they can you know, join uh, our effort here. Uh, another colleague of mine is from urban planning and he is also working on inequality issues where uh, some groups of people are located in hard to get areas like uh, they are poor and they they are uh, among the elderly groups and uh, they they have difficulty using the uh, ubiquitous uh, apps that that uh, we in Thailand are using but but in, in some remote areas, it's a bit difficult to uh, get the incentive for the, the people, uh, the riders or people who deliver the food to go there. So uh, he's working on mechanisms to help redress that problem. And another colleague of mine is working. She is also from philosophy as, as I am, and she's working in epistemology, especially in social epistemology and she's working on epistemic injustice and obviously that has a lot of implication for uh, our concern here uh, tonight which is uh, inequality so epistemic inequality if I may so uh, my current project uh, I'm, I'm being a part of a uh, project an international project on uh, incubating feminist AI, which is funded by the IDRC from Canada. And the project spans many countries all around the globe. Our main objective in this project is to find out ways in which AI could contribute to a more, uh, uh, you know, gender equal society, uh, to, to more uh, gender equality how to reduce the biases that uh, many believe are inherent in the AI algorithms themselves and uh, identify the challenges uh, that are there in order to, to make AI kind of uh, a more kind of a positive force. Uh, so the project is ongoing. And if you're interested, we will be delighted to share further information with you. And as for the future, uh, I believe personally, and, and this has been my, my work for quite some time, that, uh, I mean, uh, some philosophers are quite uh, pessimistic about technology. Uh, they think that you know they it's, it's, uh, they they could uh, bring about some some bad things you know. Uh, however, uh, I I don't think uh, that is automatically 
the case. I think I think we can uh, look at how technology could contribute to social goods and how how technology could be designed from the ground up in such a way i mean i'm not talking only about ai we we can uh make a, another level of higher abstraction and look at technology in general and and find a way in which uh you know technology could be our ally so to speak uh it's quite it's quite a challenge it's difficult but i think it's it's possible so uh, that's all from me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, relates to an upcoming panel that we'll also be hosting. You might want to tune in on AI and new media um, right. and really to bring the, the justice and equality question uh, to bear as well. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Dr. Casey McCall-Smith at the University of Edinburgh. Great, thank you very much. Um, so as she said, my name is Casey McCall Smith. I'm a senior lecturer in public international law at Edinburgh Law School and the director of our Global Justice Academy, as well as the chair of the Association of Human Rights Institutes. So as you can imagine um, with these areas, um, my research predominantly focuses on international law and the way in which international law is implemented in national and subnational legal systems um, through both law and policy. In effect, my work aims to explain how international law, law that seems often is criticized for being out of reach and irrelevant, um, I'm interested in how it actually shapes our daily lives in very big and small ways. Um, in particular, my focus on human rights law has led to some very interesting projects, um, both here in Scotland and in the United States, where I'm from. Um, so one of the ways in which I've been looking at this connection has been through monitoring the military commissions in Guantanamo as a means of investigating the U.S. implementation of the protections outlined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the U.N. Convention Against Torture. Um, this has had an important um, knock-on um, consideration for the ways in which the U.S. uses its political influence to shape the world. Through this work, I have examined the ways that the U.S. approaches um, the issue of torture and trial, fair trial rights um, and how the way this has played out in Guantanamo has the potential to engender kind of relaxation of many fundamental rights that were formerly considered sacred in the U.S., um, here in the UK, for the past few years, my work has focused on the incorporation of international human rights treaties um, into the devolved um, Scottish legal system and how changes to law and policy at this sub-state level interact with the broader UK legal system. Um, this stream of my work has presented the opportunity for me to develop a wide network of partnerships, both across the university and across civil society. Um, and we work together to kind of translate um, legalese into usable advocacy language. So much of my work has been facilitated in conjunction with the Global Justice Academy, as well as the Edinburgh Center for International and Global Law at Edinburgh University. Um, the DJA is one of our many research centers in the law school, and it partners with other research centers across the university um, so that we can develop a multidisciplinary approach to global challenges. Other centers include the Global Agricultural and Food Academy, the Children's Rights Observatory for Scotland, and the Center for Security Research. And this is just a small sample of the spaces at Edinburgh where there are opportunities to address inequalities and, and social justice issues. So along these lines, we've joined uh, four with academics working in, uh, in children's areas. For example, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child has been a focus of mine, and we've looked at how the sociology of early years, primary and secondary education, the use of uh, artificial intelligence in education and service provision, um, and inequalities in the health um, services, and the relationship between the economy and deprivation in low-income populations impact children and their development in to adults and engaged citizens. So really what I think we have to offer and where there are great connections to be made is through the impact of securing a more equal existence for all members of society. And that's the focus of many of our projects. In this context, law can, cannot 
can be cannot be understood without a deeper understanding of the sociology of deprivation, cycl cyclical marginalization, and multi generation generational barriers to accessing education, health services, and the many um, different um, engagement opportunities that society provides. So I think I'll close it there. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. And next we'll go to Dr. Jean Hong from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Hi, thanks for inviting me to this um, exciting salon. I have been, you know, myself learning a lot from other colleagues around the world. So I'm a political scientist and then a an associate professor at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. My research area is um, authoritarian politics and authoritarian legacies in East Asia. Given that all um, the panelists today discuss today's topic, inequality and social justice in diverse contexts of democracy, what I may be able to contribute to is the uh, to the diversity of today's discussion is by adding perspectives from authoritarian context. Um, so China is one of my main study fields and how China handles inequality and social uh, justice is relatively, um, I believe, understudied so far. Of course, inequality and social justice issue in China is not different from other part of the world um, in that it has been increasing, uh, um, it has been increasingly um, a severe, uh, serious social issue uh, in the country. However, I think there are um, several critical and unique aspects um, that the Chinese inequality issue differ from um, other, especially democratic contexts. Um, so uh, let me summarize a few of them. So first is, um, I think, the speed. Um, so as China is one of the fast gro growing economy in the world, um, the, the inequality, the increase in inequality has been also um, uh, probably one of the ra uh, rapid, most rapid um, in among the uh, developing countries and probably uh, in the world. And second is how citizens react to the increasing inequality and how government deal with the inequality. So, um, so citizens um, in um, citizen, how citizens participate in politics and social issues in China, uh, as we all know, are different from other, other contexts. So overall, the media environment is very closed and information flow is in, uh, in transparent uh, with the internet censorship and media monitoring, all that. Um, so uh, while in other countries, um, civil societies and media and uh, researchers like us uh, must be the main forces that push the government to act against the inequality, increasing inequality, um, these are uh, these paths are uh, quite uh, relatively limited in China. Nonetheless, um, it doesn't mean that citizens cannot express their uh, frustration about inequality at all. I think the, uh, this uh, inequality and social justice is probably one of those topics that can be uh, uh, very actively discussed, on, especially online, and uh, relatively uncensored. And sometimes that creates um, uh, enough voice uh, online, and then that led to uh, actual changes in government policy, especially at the local level, to address certain um, issues that were heatedly he 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 debated online. And the uh, last and uh, most um, unique aspect of Chinese inequality and social justice issue is that the government play uh, the most uh, important and most active role uh, addressing this issue. So the government uh, well understand this is the most critical issue the, uh, that harms the stability, uh, regime stability and the legitimacy of the communist regime. So um, despite the economic growth and all the other achievements uh, that China had uh, had recent years. So, um, so given that this is the issue that potentially trigger anger and frustrations among citizens, uh, the government had uh, launched a lot of uh, policies, especially recently, to uh, uh, tackle this issue. So, for instance, curbing the private company's activities and um, uh, limiting private education and to some extent anti-corruption campaign, all these, um, uh, you know, big 
policy changes are connected, very closely connected actually to the issue of inequality and social justice. And overall citizens have been quite uh, very supportive about these government's policy drive um, so far. Uh, so they, uh, the policies have been rather unilateral and very much government driven and in some sense punitive, but citizens have been uh, very supportive because they they believe this is uh, what government does tackles inequality and um, this is related to redistributive justice and eventually social justice. So these are um, things that I have been um, considering recent um, days and uh, thinking about new research on this topic uh, in the context of China. I hope um, this uh, add, add you know, more diversity to our discussion today. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. Really wonderful um, to think about that perspective as well. Our final panelist is Dr. Chantal Thomas at Cornell University. Thanks so much for hosting this excellent series. And I'm uh, looking forward to participating in more of these salons over the course of the semester. Thanks to the audience as well for listening to this lightning round of presentations. And I'll try my best to bring us home within my allotted time. Um, so I work broadly speaking on how international laws and institutions have shaped and are shaped by inequality as measured across a variety of socioeconomic metrics. And some of my work takes on the apparent paradox that gains in global poverty reduction, so increases in income growth, have never been greater than the past 20 years, but also income inequality is now greater than at any time on record, as Professor Basu described at the top of this discussion. Uh, at the US, it's higher than at any time since the Great Depression. Um, so for all the gains in global poverty reduction across some regions of the world, we see lags in other regions in the global north and south and also deepening domestic inequality. A common narrative here is that those entities that participated in economic liberalization benefited from the gains it offers and others who were resistant lost. And in my work, I show that this narrative lies very far from the truth, that in fact, the playing field has not been level across territories participating in global markets and structural disadvantages have arisen both from resource endowments that were themselves in part a product of historical legacy that can be traced significantly to a difference between colonized and non-colonized territories and peoples, and that those disadvantages have also arisen from ongoing disparities in international trade rules that have set up double standards that themselves perpetuate this historical legacy. And also domestic policy space has been far too inattentive to the question of distributive consequences of trade liberalization. And I show how that's arisen from formal theoretical limitations with trade policy itself, which is concerned with aggregate gains and not the distribution of those gains. But I also question to what extent these limitations have arisen from less formal modes of ideological legitimation. I've also looked outside the typical parameters of international economic law to ask how forms of socioeconomic inequality have been shaped by and have shaped international institutions. So in some work on international trade and people of African heritage, I look at global agricultural markets to unearth how the historical legacy of racial capitalism not only shaped the landscape of global economic inequality, but continues to be seen in discriminatory rules and practices, both in international economic law and in US domestic law related to global trade. Another issue I've studied at some length is the relationship between trade and migration. Even though migration falls outside the scope of most trade agreements, it of course is affected by the trade flows that those agreements create with implications for some of the most pressing humanitarian challenges in global policy, in particular those related to human trafficking or what is sometimes called modern day slavery. And finally, in this little thumbnail sketch of some of my work, I'll highlight a more recent area of study that has been gender and political economy, in which I and collaborators look at how gendered forms of economic production and social reproduction are deeply integrated into global markets and goods, services, and labor. So in much of this work, I've been very fortunate to participate in several interdisciplinary initiatives and institutions at Cornell. The Migrations Initiative, which was chosen as the first Cornell Global Grand Challenge, which fosters interdisciplinary dialogue. And I've been supported in several collaborations there, both within 
the law school, which is my home institution and across a number of other departments at the university. The Ainaudi Center under Professor Riedel's leadership and its initiative on inequalities, identities, and justice, which has centered global racial justice among other themes. And there I've been very fortunate to be a, a global public voices fellow uh, for this year. And that's been a very rich discussion. I've specifically participated as well in programming on the contemporary Middle East with uh, several folks across uh, university departments. And so uh, I hope that in some of these remarks, I've shown that this in, that interdisciplinary work is absolutely crucial in studying inequality. And I'll just point to one final uh, study that I'm uh, involved in now, which we hope to contribute to the US International Trade Commission, which is now trying to look more seriously at the distributive consequences of trade policy and working with colleagues in the ILR school and other departments to conduct an interdisciplinary literature review that can inform some of that current policy work. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chantelle, and all of our experts um, on this panel today for joining us in this salon. Um, I think it really highlights the many levels of connection that we have to share with each other, the different perspectives and disciplinary um, backgrounds that we have, but also the real potential for collaboration as we move forward. We'll be in touch with all of the panelists as well as the audience. Please do put in the Q&A if you have related research that you'd like to um, bring to bear to this topic um, so that we can continue the conversation um, together and imagine new projects together. Thank you all so much for your expertise and we look forward to our next discussion.